demand for holding wealth. By the 1850s, slave property had become so valuable that it was, what Stephen Deal says, that it was no longer possible to consider eliminating it. By 1860, historians, it's a conservative estimate, put the total value of slave property at $3 billion. It's a large number indeed. It's roughly three times greater than the total amount of all capital, North and South combined, invested in manufacturing. Almost three times the amount invested in railroads, and seven times the amount invested in banks. The value of slaves amounted to seven times the value of all currency in circulation, by Deal's estimate. Now, that may not be right, because what do you mean by currency? It's very hard to tell. There's lots of different kinds of things circulating, and some of them are legal and some of them aren't. There are lots of counterfeits circulating as if they're real. But it gets to the heart of the point. The value of slaves exceeded the value of gold. Slaves constituted the bullion that allowed that mass of token money, shaky banknotes, private paper, and counterfeits to circulate. Our slaves constitute the greatest portion of our wealth, Virginian slaveholder James Golson declared, and by their value, they regulate the price of nearly all the property we possess. Now that's a quote that describes the function of gold. gold people who want the gold standard will say, the price of eggs will go up and down, gold will stay the same. Gold never changes value. It regulates the value of other things. That's exactly what Golson is saying slaves do. They regulate the value of other things. It gives the slave the exact function that gold was supposed to play. So slaves had a real labor value and a commodity value dependent on the idea of racial difference, which of course was elaborately maintained in the face of the fact that race was not non-negotiable. This of course is what everybody says is one of the striking things about the American experience of race, that despite the evidence of mixture, Americans will, pref and that is that race is not a static immovable, Americans will continue to act as if it is. And that's a puzzle. Why did they do that? I mean, I've been working on it for years. How did you continue to believe in intractable, ineluctable racial difference if you grew up on a plantation where the slaves were your half-brothers? That's a, that's a real challenge. You know, how, how did you maintain that? There are probably a lot of answers for that. I think it was crucial that they maintain it because their banking system, their currency system was founded on that. Their system of, of circulation was founded on until 1844, local banks in England could print their own banknotes, but they mostly did compared to the United States. Neil Ferguson describes the Bank of England as having a de facto monopoly of banknote issues by the early 19th century. In 1833, paper notes of the Bank of England became legal tender, not simply another form of money, but money that the law compelled you to accept. The bank kept gold in its reserves, but by the 1830s, its notes were the standard currency of the British Empire, legal tender for all transactions. So when England voted to abolish slavery in 1833, by buying the slaves, it paid in pounds sterling, the standard money of the British Empire, and the ultimate, stable, established standard of value for commerce. Slaves had value in the British Empire, but their value existed in relation to a stable standard, the Bank of England note. In the United States, on the other hand, Slaves had a value which itself formed the basis of the southern economy. Slave property is the foundation of all property in the south, the Bones Review wrote. When security in this is shaken, all other property partakes of its instability. Abolishing slavery in the United States would abolish the foundation of credit and the psychic capital that underlay the chaotic monetary system. Historians have recognized for years that slave owning founded the master's sense of self that had a psychological value in addition to its <coughs> financial value. And I want to extend that. It was more than simply a psychic value that it extended into the pocketbook and the purse in a different way than people think. Slaves anchored the sense of white superiority while they enabled the expansion of credit and an astonishing variety of regular and irregular forms of money. The presence of slaves as fixed capital funded or founded the speculative, transformative economy. Ironically, they made it possible for the profusion of money forms that allowed free blacks like William Wells Brown to prosper. And that's where Brown is an interesting case. Paper money lets him reinvent himself really easily. But he can't, and that's what his, his life story is about. I can't reinvent being black. I can't escape this. This is a confine that this society consists, it insists on putting, putting in place. Historians of money and banking tend to ignore slavery and race altogether. Uh, if you read Bray Hammond's magisterial 742-page account 
of the history of American banking, which is high, highly entertaining. He's a really good writer. He's very witty in this very dry, high wasp way. Who's read it here? Anybody read it? Wayne, you read it. Am I right, witty? <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, he never mentioned slavery. It's not part of his purview because money is different. Money is not about slavery. It's, it's odd, but he never mentions it. <coughs> well, there's a few cursory mentions, but nothing substantive. Almost without exception, Walter Johnson wrote, any bellum historians treat slavery as a labor system without acknowledging that it was also a system of capital accumulation. Economic historians who study the history of money typically disregard slavery's central role in the economy or treat slaves as economic units without considering the contested, ambiguous quality of the money they were valued in. And people who write about slavery typically don't talk about the money because that's a different subject. What I'm trying to argue here is that it's impossible to maintain that separation. We need to consider slaves, we need their integral role in the antebellum economy. And to do that, we need to rethink what we mean when we talk about money and what we talk about economics. I think I better stop there and go on too long. So I'll take questions. Okay.